In this segment, we're going to go into detail about Garou and Fong shading. Let's first talk about Garou shading, which is the standard smooth shading. Note also that this is a lecture that actually talks about the operations that happen in rasterization. In a standard vertex or pixel shader, you would just set, give the colors for I1, I2, and I3. And after you've done that, you would expect the rasterization hardware in OpenGL to do the interpolation. So you don't need to worry about the details of this for Garou shading. However, we are interested in learning for this course what actually goes on under the hood. So here you have three vertices, uh, I1, I2, I3. And those correspond to the colors here. So we assume I1 is the color at vertex 1, I2 is the color at vertex 2, I3 is the color at vertex 3. Notice that the vertical extent goes from Y1 all the way to Y3. So we want to find first, the, for, to find the color of IP, we first want to find the colors at IA and IB, and then we want to interpolate them. So let's first talk about the color at IA. IA lies between I1 and I2. So if you want to do the interpolation, we do it along the vertical direction. Look at the length of this region and the length of this region. So the length of this region is Y1 minus Ys. The length here is Ys minus Y2. The total length, of course, is Y1 minus Y2. Now it's just a question of doing the standard interpolation formula which will mean that I1, because it's further away from I1, it will be multiplied by the smaller quantity. So this will get I1, and this quantity will multiply I2. Indeed, that's the formula here. I1 times Ys minus Y2, plus I2 times Y1 minus Ys. And divide the whole thing by the total length here, which is Y1 minus Y2. That's the formula for IA. We can similarly get a formula for IB, which is will be equal to I1 times, in this case, Ys minus Y3, and I3 times Y1 minus Ys, and now you normalize by Y1 minus Y3. Once you have the formulae for IA and IB, the question is, what do you get for IP? And in order to consider that, one needs to consider the x-coordinates because one is interpolating within a scan line. So we can consider this as being the x of A, and we can consider this as being x of B. Here, of course, you have x of P. So the interpolation idea is the same. You have this uh, length, which is xp minus xa, and you have this length, which is xp minus xp. So IA will be multiplied by XB minus XB, and IB will be multiplied by XB minus XA. Indeed, this is what happens here. So you have IA times XB minus XP, plus IB, which is multiplied by XP minus XA, and again, you normalize by XB minus XA. So it's just interpolation first in the vertical direction in order to get the locations for the endpoints of the scan line and then interpolation along the scan line to get the uh, horizontally to get the final color of IP. The actual implementation of this is much more efficient than the formula will let you believe. For example, I can pre-compute the division by y1 minus y2. I can find the reciprocal of that, y1 minus y3, xp minus xa. And moreover, you see, as you go from one scan line to the next, the multiplicative factors, they reduce to addition. And therefore, they're very efficient algorithms that in fact don't involve multiplication or division at all, that just incrementally add quantities as you go from one scan line to the next. And this is a process which is generally known as scan conversion, but it also does the interpolation which is needed for gross shading. Errors, we've already talked about those in the previous segment. So here is an uh, extreme case where I1 and I2 are zero because either the light is pointing backwards or the eye does not see the point. And now you have zeros in both cases and you want to interpolate to make a highlight. Of course, that's not going to happen. If you have zero at the two vertices, the interpolation is also zero. And so Garou cannot can have problems. Moreover, the way we implemented it, where we went vertically and then horizontally, means the shading is not rotationally invariant.
So if you were to rotate a point, you would actually see the shading change. For all of these reasons, Gros shading is useful only when you have relatively smooth shading effects, mostly for diffuse shading. But prior to the advent of fragment shaders, you also needed to use Gros shading for specular highlights. And the way you handled that was by tessellating or breaking the model into enough triangles that relative to the size of the triangles, the shading was still smooth. Next, we consider the Fong illumination model, which is really the motivation also for the use of Fong shading and the use of fragment shaders. And this corresponds to a specular or glossy material where you have highlights. At the bottom, I've just shown some renderings I made many years ago where you've taken a lighting environment or a light probe that was acquired at Berkeley by Paul Depoek. It's in the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. And I've rendered images with many different roughness settings. And you'll see from left to right, it starts off being a mirror, then it gets blurred out. And eventually on the right, it almost looks like a diffuse surface. And that the amount of roughness controls the width of the highlights and your perception of how shiny the object is. Examples of specular glossy materials are polished floors, uh, glossy paint, whiteboards. Furthermore, highlights behave somewhat differently from plastics or dielectric materials as opposed to metals. So in plastics, the highlight is the color of the light source, not the body color of the object. And this is a very common thing. You could have a green ball and you look at the highlight, it's still white because the light source is white. Metals, on the other hand, the highlight depends on the surface color and is modulated by the surface color. We don't have time to go into the physics of all of these effects. Uh, hopefully that's something you can look up or we can cover in a future course. But these are basic properties of illumination and highlights. And it's also possible to regard them really as blurred reflections of the light source. If you look at the bottom panel, you can consider that the light source is just being blurred out as you go from left to right. So Fong illumination coupled with Fong shading is the appropriate way to make highlights. And again, it's worth noting the distinction between these. They're commonly used together, but technically they're different aspects. The idea of Fong shading is simply that instead of interpolating the colors, what one actually does is interpolate the normals. So here we have the color was zero, but there's a correct normal at both of these locations. You interpolate the normal, and so you get the correct normal at the center, and therefore you can evaluate the illumination model and get a highlight. So the entire lighting calculation is performed for each pixel. In old style OpenGL, there was no Fong shading. It was just Goro shading. And therefore you would have to break this geometry up into enough triangles that it did actually compute the shading at each vertex. But in modern OpenGL in homework two, you just write a fragment shader and in this way you can do perfect Fong shading. Let us now look at the vertex shader. Remember that this vertex shader comes from the MITES 3 suite of programs. I encourage you to look at the code for these programs and the shaders to get an idea of what you can do in OpenGL. First line says version 330 core, which just tells OpenGL that this shader is using GLSL 3.30, which is what we're using in our course. Let's now come to the per vertex inputs to the shader. They're in location zero, location one, and location two. The layout command says which location are they in. In just says their inputs, and Reg3 says what kind of information is there. In this case, the position is the x, y, and z coordinates, which is a three vector. The normal similarly is the x, y, and z coordinates. It's a three vector. The texture coordinates input are just two variables, which are typically denoted as s and t. The outputs are the extra outputs from the vertex shader, which will be interpolated or rasterized and sent to the fragment shader. These correspond to my vertex for lighting calculations, my normal, again, for the surface normals and the fragment shader for lighting calculations, and the texture coordinates, which will be provided to the fragment shader. Let's look in more detail at the shader. Again, we have the version 330 core. This was all the code we saw earlier. The uniform variables are variables that are the same for all vertices. 
In this case, they are the projection matrix and the model for view matrix. Both projection and model view matrices are four by four matrices, which are specified with the command uniform mat four. Is text simply says, are we doing texturing or are we not? It's just a flag. The main routine is where the vertex shader is actually executed. GL position is a defined variable which sets the position within OpenGL for rasterization, which says where the vertex should go on the screen. As is conventional, the vertex location will be given by multiplying by the model view matrix and the projection matrix, in fact, by the product of the projection and model view matrices. Notice that we are now doing things in homogeneous coordinates, and therefore we have to define a VEC4 taking the XYZ coordinates of the position and the W coordinate equal to one. We also define the normal, which will be used in the fragment shader. This simply applies the normal transformation. Note that the normal transformation is given by the inverse transpose of the model view matrix, which is why we are doing transpose inverse model view times the normal. We define the vertex location in I coordinates in the 3D world. This is different from GL position, which applies the projection matrix and tells you where it goes in the screen or in normalized device coordinates. However, we also need the value in I coordinates in the 3D world for later shading calculations in the fragment shader. That is done by multiplying the model view matrix times the position, again, in homogeneous coordinates, we made it a VEC4. Finally, we come to the texture coordinates. To avoid errors, I initially set the texture coordinate to 0, 0, which is just a default value to prevent errors. In the next step, if texturing is turned on, then I have texture coordinates that were input to the vertex shader, and I just set text coord equal to that. These texture coordinates will then be interpolated and rasterized, and they will be passed on to the fragment shader for texturing. The next thing we're going to talk about is the type of different lighting and materials, lights, points, and directional, and shading, ambient, diffuse, emissive, and specular.